morning, Miriam. Good morning. Thank you so much for hosting this incredible conference. And I want to thank Maria. She's been working uh, night and day, not just prepare for this conference, but our our team at the governor's office, uh, people think, oh, the governor's office must be huge. There's 16 people that work in the governor's office. Uh, two of them, Maria and then Jace Beeler, were both former school teachers. That's one eighth of our staff. And so I just wanted to share with all of you educators that we have a higher percentage of school teachers on my staff than there are school teachers as a percent of population in North Dakota. So they're overrepresented on our team. They do a fantastic job. They've done a great job here. And uh, I want to you know, thank you and thank everybody that worked on this to put it together. But let's give Maria and the team a hand. Way to go. Thank you. Thank you. You'll be seeing Maria all day long as our MC, but I want to just again say thank you to all of you for coming here today for the fifth annual Governor's Summit on Innovative Education. It's wonderful to see so many of you here in person. So thank you for your presence. Uh, we're we're going to definitely be tapping into all of you uh, through some of the exercises today, but we know there's we know there's even more than there are here in the room participating virtually. We've all gotten used to the hybrid the hybrid world, and uh, that's certainly happening here. And of course, all these great keynotes and breakouts today are gonna be available for follow-up on taping, so we know there's gonna be broad reach on what happens, but thank you for, for being here. <clears throat> I also wanna start this year, as I often do, with, with uh, gratitude. Uh, and wow, what a year to be saying a thank you uh, to everybody. Uh, so let's begin with gratitude. And this, this year, with educators at the top of the list, more than any, we need to say, to me to say thank you to you. Uh, and, the, and, and, and the reason why, of course, is because of uh, everything that you've done in the past year. I mean, what an amazing year. You've wrapped up one of the most challenging school years in state history since the beginning of teaching in our state. Uh, and, it's, and I think, again, well, it'll take a while for all the data collection come in. I think it's safe to say that by, by many, many accounts, it was a successful year and certainly by comparison. And the job that I am in, uh, one of the things that I think that's happened in the last year is governors have talked to other governors more times in the last 15 months than at any time in our nation's history. Uh, there's weekly calls with the governors, uh, with the White House of both administrations. There's uh, been, been calls within uh, <clears throat> regional calls. You call your neighbors. There's been calls within you know, Republican Democrats, or Republican governors, Democrat governors, talking to each other and sharing ideas and sharing best practices. But even as recently as a couple weeks ago when I was on one of these calls and it was heartbreaking to hear other governors talk about how their kids had not been back in the classroom the entire year, this entire year. I mean, can you imagine uh, the, the challenges that that would be for parents and families and students and employers and everybody involved and for the, for the teachers? But here in North Dakota, where for the most part, we've had kids in school, we've had businesses open, and we've managed through this thing. I wanted to say uh, thank you for the incredible work because all of you are on the front lines uh, doing amazing work at the administrative level, the school building level, all of that to keep things going. So I, I want to say thank you. And, and again, <clears throat> we know the power of a positive teacher-student relationship. We know that, that the impact one individual can have a dramatic impact on our life, whether that's a teacher, a coach, a mentor. And, <clears throat> and I think that during COVID, we learned a number of things. And one of the things that we learned that is that during that time when some of you were, had gone uh, virtual, many of you literally had a chance to see into your students' homes. And you got a chance to see the challenges that some of those students were facing in their home environment. And the flip side, I can't tell you how many parents have said to me, uh, you know, when we got to get our kids back in school, and the reason why we got to get our kids back in school is because they learned how hard the job is that all of you do every single day. And I want to say again, I'm sure you realize that, but give yourselves a hand, thank you. <clears throat> So with parents having a greater understanding of what our teachers do, and with our administrators, our building leaders, the school board members that had to step up to answer questions and face criticisms as elected, anybody who was an elected official, a mayor, a school board uh, member, a city council member, was taking more calls this year from citizens than probably ever before. Our school nurses were amazing, the paraprofessionals, the custodial staff. Last year, when we first had to shut down, when we knew so many things a year ago in the spring, we had, we had the, the staff that was working on nutrition, delivering meals out to students around the state, bus drivers working on that. 
uh, parents, guardian, community leaders, and certainly our legislators, and we'll acknowledge a number of them, and there's some that are here today, but everybody was, was working together during this time frame. And so I want to say again, thank you to all of you. I want to also say, share gratitude with Superintendent Baszler. We're so fortunate to have a elected leader who's been in the classroom. She's been an administrator and has served as president of a school board. She's been a true partner with the governor's office since we took office. And you know, together and with, along with all of you as we navigated 175 districts through COVID, <clears throat> understanding that each district had different challenges and different geographies and, and different uh, capabilities. But the one thing that I can tell you in any meeting I've ever been in with Superintendent Baszler is she always puts student at the center of the discussion. She always puts the students first, and that's, that's fantastic. I want to say I'm grateful to have her here as part of the conference and grateful to have her speaking here this afternoon. So across the board, uh, from anybody that was involved in the school district, this is the opportunity. Give yourselves right now a standing ovation for the amazing job you did during this last year. Way to go, educators. There's another great partner that I've had, uh, you know, during the time that I've been in office, and uh, and it's been a great partner for all of you as well. But one of the things when we first met with educators when I first took office, the number one thing that came up four years ago was behavioral health, uh, and we said we need to make progress on this, and we go we need to go hand in hand with K-12 so the teachers can teach. And one of the things that we know is that <clears throat> the disease of addiction affects every family, it affects every business, it affects every institution uh, in our state. We also know that when you say that, that means that it affects every school building in our state, whether it's at the student level, the staff level, or some other way, because when an individual is facing mental health or the disease of addiction, these challenges that are brain diseases, when they're facing that, it affects the whole family, not just the person that has the challenge with the disease. And one of the things that has happened and happens around our country, happens around the world, but unfortunately happens perhaps more in North Dakota, we're one of the first states that's actually done a survey to understand stigma and shame and how the stigma and shame are related to the disease of addiction and behavioral mental health issues causes people to not want to seek treatment. Think about it. This would be like you yourself know you have a problem. You know you've got diabetes. You know you've got cancer, but you don't want to tell even your closest friends. And so then you don't go get treatment for your diabetes. You don't go get treatment for your heart disease. The disease of addiction and mental health, these are chronic progressive diseases, just like heart disease and just like diabetes. And if left untreated, they're ultimately fatal. So what does it take in the face of that to try to overcome that? It takes courage. And I have one word for our First Lady, which is courageous. And she has stood up and shared her challenges and her, and her, her success in recovery in overcoming mental health challenges and addiction challenges and has become a face and a voice of recovery. She's here with me today. She's a champion of all years. Give it up for the First Lady of North Dakota right here, Catherine Helgus Burgum. <laughs> So uh, I've got a challenge. I got, I'm gonna have three challenges during this talk from small and simple to big. The first one right now is, uh, has to do with this idea that we know that somebody in your life along the way made a difference in your life. A coach, a mentor, a teacher, someone made that difference. You've got note cards in front of you. So the first thing we we're gonna do today, the challenge is I want you to write down the name of the person that somehow helped you. Maybe it was somebody that came through and helped you get through a tough moment during COVID in the last year. Maybe it was someone that helped you with your, when you were a kid. Uh, and before the end of the day, we've got some tools there. We've got gratitude postcards. I think they're sitting there in the shape of North Dakota on your table. Grab one of those, take them with you. They're actual postcards. Uh, the US Postal Service will accept them. You have to put a stamp on them. I don't think they're prepaid, uh, but you can, on those, those postcards, write a note, just a short little note to this person, maybe you haven't talked to them in 20 years, and say thank you, because the best gift we can give in life is gratitude. I had a chance this last year 
uh, to do that in person. Uh, one of my individuals that made a difference in my life was my sixth grade teacher, Mrs. McKinsey. Uh, it, was a, it was a tough year. We had Arthur in North Dakota, Erie, North Dakota, and Hunter. And Erie, it's not Erie like a scary movie. It's got missing one E. It's just Erie like the lake, not Erie like, like ooh, it's really Erie. Uh, <clears throat> so, but we had Erie, and we had Hunter, and we had Arthur, and we merged to form a, a school at that time called Dakota. And, uh, and, you know, and when you're merging, I mean, it's like, wow, you're going with all of these strange kids that grew up six miles away, and they've got, they're so different than you. Uh, but we had to come together, and she had the challenge of trying to bring sixth graders from two towns together. Uh, and she taught math, she taught social studies, she made it fun, she cared for the kids, she helped us bond into a class uh, which went on, by all accounts, to be the greatest class ever to graduate from Dakota High School. Just ask anybody else in our class. Uh, compared to anybody that graduated before or afterwards, but it was incredible. But I had the opportunity to spend time with her uh, at the governor's residence this last year and share that gratitude in person. So your challenge is grab a Coast Guard, write down somebody's name, and, and send a gratitude note to someone who made a difference in your life. Uh, humility is one of the four values that we've talked about in our administration since we took office. Uh, and. And the reason why we adopted humility as one of the values that we wanted to have uh, across all of our cabinet agencies is because we understood coming into this thing after spending a life in the, in, in the in technology industry, which is a very humbling industry because just when you think you know something, you wake up in the morning and you find out a competitor has released something that could put you out of business, that there's some new technology that you'd never heard of that you're gonna have to adopt and you just when you thought you were gonna get escape velocity, then all of a sudden you're back at the drawing board and you might have another six months or years worth of work. And that only went on for me for the 35 years I was in tech, but it's just like, it just never stops. With Moore's Law, doubling of computer power at half the price every 18 months, and no regulation that protects any company. Any company is allowed to go out of business at any time. It doesn't matter, there's no restrictions on imports. Foreign products can come in from around the world and just blow you up without any notice. So that humility came from that part of that industry, and we learned two things in that industry, which is one, that we can learn from anyone. You can, just like you can learn from your customers, you can learn from your competitors. In this case, we can learn from our students, and we can learn not from our best students, we can learn from our students that are struggling in school. Sometimes those are the ones that maybe, they're the ones that need to tell us how we need to do it differently. And, and so we know that we can learn from anyone, and this applies to all of our agencies. Uh, we can learn from, <clears throat> from anyone at any time. So that's one kind of humility. We are not smarter than the people that we serve. They have walked in their shoes. We need to learn from them. But the second part of humility, which is so critical, particularly during a time like COVID, is that we have to have the humility to understand that things that we absolutely, positively believe to be true may turn out to not be true, okay? This is, a, this is our life last year. We all lived this together, okay? We're, we're there last spring. Things are taking off. There's no testing. There was a lot more COVID on the first half of that slide than what's shown there because you need, to, you need to match this graph against the rate of testing that was going on as well. There was a ton of COVID going on last spring, and we just didn't, we didn't know it. There was, you couldn't get a test. There was no testing. But... <clears throat> And then we were told a bunch of things about this is the way it transmits and this is the way it doesn't and masks works and masks don't and vaccines work and vaccines are safe and vaccines aren't safe and vaccines are safe again. I mean, all of the things, changing, 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 constantly changing. It's very easy to sit today and look back and say, gee, as a teacher, an administrator, a school board, I would have made a different decision a year ago. You cannot Monday morning quarterback something that was constantly changing and constantly new information a year or 15 months later. That would be an impossible tack, but plenty of people seem to have the energy to do it. We're looking forward, but I just wanna say, you all went through this. You all had to make decisions and we got through it together. And what happened during this time frame is in North Dakota, when we were working to safely keep our kids in school and keep doing the jobs we have to do to educate our next generation, we also opened a window on innovation. We took that disruption and we use that as an impetus to reimagine how we can deliver education. And there are some things that we can do differently on that. And it's changing every agency in our state. 
Today's paper here in town talks about how COVID is changing our judicial system for the good forever in terms of positive things. So there's a lot of things that came. There are silver linings and you're gonna, people are gonna be talking about this afternoon. But some of the, 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 the notable dates, I mean, we went from the first case in North Dakota to classes being suspended to distance learning. Congratulations to all of you. No one knew when you started last year's school year you're gonna have to do that. And then on August 26th, we did what few states did. We got people back in the classroom and we showed that we could do it safely. We navigated through an incredible peak last fall when hospital capacity was stretched. And then we had to, we had to pause school activities, uh, which again, <clears throat> from our office, I'm telling you, pausing sports for two weeks, wow. I don't think any of you would have wanted to make that decision because we heard about it. But we got through that two week pause and we kept winter sports going and winter activities and music and, and speech and all of the other things and we got through it. And here we are on June 6th and we're doing as well as any state in the country. And again, thank you for your, your perseverance, your imagination and everything you did to go through that. We did work as one. We worked as one across districts, across communities across local public health, across DPI, across the governor's office, across the National Guard, and, and literally dozens and dozens of other agencies that all came together to make sure that we could keep focusing on our missions like educating and caring for our students. There were some great creative thought leadership. We can only have time for a couple of examples, but I know that you know them, but I'm gonna give a shout out to one up at UND where, the, where the, universe, the University of North Dakota, the Grand Forks School District, they partnered to open up a new mentor center during COVID. Uh, they used the governor's emergency education relief funds, which you might know more as gear funds, but they've identified a successful strategy to add another layer of support. And that is gonna keep on going forward. But this mentor center provided one-stop shop for academic services, mental health services, food access, technology support, community partners in, that supported activity programs. So again, very, very successful way to go up there. Uh, we also, uh, this afternoon, you're gonna hear from members of the K-12 Coordination Council. They've got a breakout entitled COVID-19 Silver Linings about ways that many schools delivered creative solutions to best serve their communities. And that will be available as a breakout. It'll also be available online because I think we have 17 breakouts. You can't go to all of them, but I would encourage people to after this is over tomorrow or this week, put time on your calendar and watch the, all those breakouts. There's great learning in all of them. But the learning disruptions have been opportunities in some cases for learning acceleration and students need learning designed around positive relationships that support student growth. They integrate, they integrate academic experience with the arts, with movement. You'll hear about movement today in one of our breakouts, community and other enriching content to order to accelerate learning. So again, uh, thank you for all of that. Shifting to the next topic, I wanna talk just briefly about something that those that know me know is a favorite topic of mine, which is inputs versus outcomes. And I think you've all heard the saying that you, know, you can be in a situation where you're data rich and information poor. Education nat nationally, no different. Education in North Dakota, no different. Uh, all kinds of efforts to let's collect data, let's collect data, let's collect data. We need more data, we need more data. We gotta show whether this works or doesn't work. But in data can tell us a story and I'm a data driven decision maker. Sometimes it can cause us to celebrate, other times it could cause us to pause and reflect. <clears throat> but one data point that is strikingly clear to me for, is funding for K-12 education. Uh, <clears throat> North Dakota loves education. You should, when you see legislator, you should cheer for them because education is supported not only better in North Dakota than nearly every other state, it's supported in North Dakota better than anything else we, we do in our state. And I will explain how that is. We are now at the level with the largest, coming out of this legislature, the largest per pupil payment in the history of K-12 spending in our state. And this shows from 2014 to 2000, you know, the 21-23 increasing. But what it doesn't show is that this was even way lower before 2010. It took a huge jump up when we, when North Dakota became an industry and you know, a leader in the oil business. When we became a leader in the oil business and oil energy, number two oil producer in the state and those tax revenues were coming in, where did it go? Boom, it went in, went a big chunk went into K-12 education. The state now pays more than 75% of the local share. You talk to other governors, that is, they, their mouths drop. 
that the state is able to pay 75%, local property taxes and others pay 25. Just in the early 2000s, it was the other way around. Locals paid 75%, the state paid 25%. So the, the, the legislator's commitment to K-12 spending is not just significant, it's huge. And now together, when we take a look at the general fund for North Dakota, which is the part we can control, that's not the federal match funds, it's not special funds. The general fund is what the legislature really has control over. I mean, take a look at this. K-12 school aid funding now from just from 1315, and we've had some two oil crashes since 2015, one in 16 and one last year when the price went, actually for oil went negative before we even got into the pandemic. We had the Saudi-Russian the Saudi oil price war that drove prices to literally down to zero in February, a month before the cases. We had unemployment skyrocketing in North Dakota a month before our first COVID case. We didn't have one black swan last year. We had a flock of them landing, you know, in the state of North Dakota. But even with that, here we are today coming out of this legislative session, 38%, a record of the general fund is going to K-12 funding. And when you throw in the spending for higher, for higher ed on top of this, it's more than 51%. We're a state that spends more than 50% of our general fund on education. I mean, let's give our legislators a round of applause just for that. I mean, they are supporting you. <clears throat> And then when COVID came along and there was you know, unbelievable amounts of money coming to the state uh, through a variety of different programs, some directly to K-12 through federal programs, there was over $540 million in the last year that came on top of, on top of the regular support. Now, if the state spends over $2 billion in a biennium, or $1 billion a year, and you throw 54, you throw 540 million on top of that in one year, that was 54% of the annual budget, boom, on top of the normal budget. You know, and some of that, of course, went towards uh, making sure that the facilities were clean and safe and disease-free, but some of that, you know, went into technology, some of it went into training, some of it went into all kinds of things that are permanent, significant, one-time changes in how we do this. And so I guess the conclusion to all this is I think it's okay for all of us when we're here at this conference and all of us as leaders to say it's okay to have high expectations about what might come out of K-12 as an outcome. And you know, those expectations can include that we've gotta build a high performing educational system that's responsible to the emotional, the physical and the academic well-being of each individual. I've said it simply as why wouldn't we have the best K-12 education system in the country. But either way, we, we've spent a lot of time and energy devoted to assessments and data collection. And, and this is you know, vitally important, but data itself you know, is not the thing that drives change. What we need to, uh, you know, as we go forward, is talk about how do, you drive, how do you drive change? Transformational leadership that creates the culture. You're gonna hear about that from Ron Berger speaking right after my keynote, creating a culture of high expectations, not just that, but a culture of excellence. And a common focus has always been on inputs from long before I left the private sector and, and, and got here in the state. And, and this, this, the input, the focus on, you know, we need more dollars, we need more dollars. Uh, you know, we have to, at least for today, for the purpose of today's discussion, uh, just set that aside because dollars per pupil does not predict success or trajectory. And, and what we, we, we have to understand is if we can just set aside for today's session the idea that we are okay on inputs. We are literally okay on inputs. Record spending from the state, record federal support. Let's spend a day today and not talk about we need more money. Let's talk about the fact that we have more money than almost any other state and let's figure out what can we do with it. And you're gonna hear like again from Ron Berger that some of the transformational ideas actually don't require more money, shocker. Okay, and one of the things that we knew as we get into this mindset of we're focusing on outcomes versus inputs is that not just the students, but we as adults, we talk about students need a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. As the adults, the policymakers, those of you that are here in person and online, we're the ones that can make a difference for 120,000 school kids, but only if we're willing to challenge the status quo, only if we're willing to let curiosity enter our conversations. 
if we're willing to, to take on more, take on challenges, and not accept the status quo, and not defend the status quo. We don't have to defend the status quo. We're not, our egos aren't attached to the status quo. If you're here, you're here because you're an innovator. Innovators are literally not attached to the status quo. Trust me, Steve Jobs, not attached to the status quo. So <clears throat> truly developing a student-centered vision that improves outcomes for, for our students that, are, that, are, that are, are, are future citizens, that's what we have to work on. But we have to change. We have to have a growth mindset. We have to think about the, and envision those outcomes versus getting hung up, putting all of our adult energy on fighting for more inputs. <clears throat> so this is the second challenge, and this is the challenge I'm, I said I was gonna have three challenges, this is the second one. <clears throat> Today, when we're having these conversations, let's not think about the input, let's think about the return on investment that achieves success for all students. <clears throat> let's take the money conversation off the table for a day, let's envision and define the outcomes that exemplify growth and student success. <clears throat> And as we do that, let me jump into the Legislative Assembly. I've already <clears throat> given them compliments, but oh my goodness, <clears throat> what a session did they have this time around. The bills that they signed this year just didn't happen overnight. These policies were shaped by years and years and years of building a co of coalition of, with visionary leaders who look to the future. It involved input from many of you about how we could work together. And again, some of this work started before uh, I had a chance uh, to even put, be in this position of service myself. But back in 2017, and you'll see some familiar faces in this slide, but I signed an executive order right shortly after getting in office that launched Governor's Innovation Education Task Force. It included legislators, teachers, parents, administrators. This group dedicated itself. We met 10 times over the course of 14 months. We met in school gymnasiums, elementary schools, high schools, class A, class B, around the state. We met with students and, <clears throat> we, uh, and we, we learned from the challenges and we learned from the innovators. Uh, <clears throat> the charter of that uh, was to establish policy recommendations that, that responded to the, the needs of, the, of all those involved those in education, the students, the families, and the communities. The number one recommendation coming out of that task force in 2018 was that, that we, the stakeholder group was that among the 10 that came out, but number one was, that was creating a personalized pathways to, to uh, graduation. Uh, and so again, in 2186, the innovation waiver was passed in 2196 Senate bill. The graduation pathway was passed. We'll talk about that. In, 20, in K-12, the Coordination Council was created. And I should say the Coordination Council is a big thing. It's not a small thing. Why is it a big thing? Again, talking to other governors. Other governors before and during COVID were facing teacher strikes. They were, they had, you know, 20,000 people in front of the Capitol in Arizona, you know, 20,000 people in front of the Capitol in, in Kansas. I mean, there, there was uh, teachers refusing to go to back to work, you know, in Massachusetts, this entire pandemic. I mean, there are other places that are just having adult battles back and forth about inputs uh, or about things that aren't really about the students. And here we have on the K-12 Coordinating Council, uh, we have, as I, I've talked to the other governors, they listen in amazement. We've got teachers unions, we've got legislators, we've got our separately elected head of DPI, we have the governor's office, we have the school administrators, their, their, their association represented, we have the school board association represented, we have regional education associations, we've got frontline teachers, we've got administrators. We got everybody sitting around the table. The K-12 coordinating council can get, you know, 18 people in the room and talk about stuff and actually have a conversation that is not happening in other states. And, and again, uh, we've got a couple of great legislators that are on there, Kyle Davidson, who leads the Southeast Educational Cooperative, Representative Pat Heinert, who's the retired Burley County Sheriff. Uh, these folks that are serving on here, and I know we've got uh, Cindy Schreiber Beck and Don Scheibel that are here, uh, Representative Center respectively, they both served on that initial innovative task force. These people are giants in the legislature. The rest, there's 141 legislators, they're listening to these people drive all the legislation that we're gonna talk about, and there's gonna be separate breakouts on this, but these things are huge that went forward and through here. And so again, I wanna, I wanna thank all of these folks 
uh, you know, <clears throat> whether it's Cindy or Don or Kyle or Pat or others, they've been incredible champions and partners. And there's others, Chairman Munson and others that have worked here, but I know that some of these folks are here. I'd like to have them stand. Let's give them a big thank you uh, for what they do. And I also say Erin Oban, who I think is on vacation, she's been key to all this as well. But legislators that are here, stand up and let us say thank you to you. <clears throat> Oh, Pat's a back row guy like I was, sitting way in the back over there. Great people come from the back row. I just got to tell you that. That's a <clears throat> uh, anyway, the, so thanks, everybody, on that. Uh, rethinking education uh, <clears throat> demands a couple things. It demands we got to rethink our space, our place, our time as we educate our students. And <clears throat> we, one thing that maybe we've learned <clears throat> in the last year is that even though there's challenges, <clears throat> Students can learn anywhere. Technology can help us, you know, bridge some of those geographical divides. You know, so that's the space. Place, you know, we, we don't have to have all of our learning occur in the classroom. We can get them out in the real world, have immersive experiences, explore, discover, solve real world problems. And time, we know this, that every child learns at a different rate and a pace, and we need to have a system that's not based on now you're finished with second grade, we're moving you into third grade, whether you learned it or not, uh, that starts separating people on paths. But we need one that's nimble and flexible. The innovative task force that we were on, one of the things that changed my view of education was a trip to Harrisburg, South Dakota. I mean, here's a community that, <clears throat> for all intents and purposes, was kind of like a Castleton. It's near, it's near Sioux Falls, but it's not Sioux Falls, and it's... <clears throat> You know, got the same kind of resource, less resources per pupil in South Dakota than we have in North Dakota. And they had a personalized learning program in K-12 where the students were every day, I, they were coming together and sitting in a room and selecting their classes. And I go, do they do this like, you know, once a quarter? And they go, no, they do it every morning. Every morning they had voice and choice on what they were gonna do that day. And they were like picking up their program and going and doing it. And we listened to teachers talk about you know, having taught in the old system for 11 years, they were in their 30s. One of them was tearful and said, I taught long enough that I saw my kids in second, third, and fourth grade math. I saw them, you know, not get all the material in second or third grade. By the time they got into high school, they weren't able to take advanced math classes and they missed out on an entire generation of careers. Now with the new model they had in Harrisburg, she saw those kids that were C students in math as a second grader becoming A students by the time they were a fifth grader because they had the time to actually catch up and learn the material. They learned at a slower rate, but they got there. And then all of them had the opportunities to go into engineering or computer science because they weren't, they weren't sidelined uh, because they didn't have all the skills you know, back in elementary school. So powerful examples that we can adopt. Uh, I want to say again, uh, <clears throat> you know, we wanted to have the ability to have new pathways. We wanted to be able to recognize a certified learning con continuum as a rigorous learning journey. And when we signed this year, the Senate Bill 2196, we now, all of you in every district has an opportunity if students can demonstrate knowledge, skills, and understanding that break the mold of traditional learning, you have an opportunity to build programs that are centered on the learner and the needs of the individual and have those programs certified by the state. This is fantastic. This creates, it's not a mandate, it's not a top down. This is an opportunity for districts to, to innovate and to transform. Just like when we passed the, the innovation wa waivers in Senate Bill 2186, some school districts grabbed those and went forward and were on the leading edge of, of change. And they've done this through community forums and school board discussions and student panels and other grassroots efforts. The legislators have created an incredible policy framework for you matched with funding that allows every school in the state, every building in the state, every classroom in the state to actually be more, to be as innovative really as you want to be. And so this is the, this is the magic of being in K-12 in North Dakota. You've got both the funding and you've got a framework where you're not strapped by a bunch of bureaucracy anymore. It's not about the number of days the kids sit in a seat during a school year. You get to decide, you get to drive this. So, I mean, it's, it's like, if you're in education, this has to be the most exciting time ever. But our work is not complete with Senate Bill 2196. It's just beginning because teachers are beginning the very important work of creating the K-12 competencies as models for our state. And we're grateful for the educators and the outside stakeholders that are involved in this. 
you know, the, the voice, the thought leadership is truly, truly valued. But you, today, if you want to attend a breakout session, if you don't have time, watch this one for sure online. Beyond Seat Time, Pathways Towards Mastery Learning provides the history of how we got to where we are in the last four years. And we know that part of this, what's going on, is also the opportunity to incorporate what were considered after-school programs. You know, as I was a kid, I watched my classmates and myself, what people were learning in 4-H, you know, in Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Campfire Girls, we, programs that had merit badges, and certification programming. FFA uh, is not, it's not your father's FFA anymore. FFA is teamed up with technology partners, and you can get cyber training through FFA and after school programs at a, national, at a national level. So that has changed and kids can now, with your support, get credit for some of the work that we're doing. And, and all, many of you, you know, have been involved in FIRST Robotics and you understand that this is, like, this is like the sports team for everybody who's not an athlete. This is, everybody can participate and they can compete and they can go win regional and state and national championships and they can learn every aspect of what it takes. And FIRST Robotics ought to be in every school building in our state. Some states have made a move to make that happen. It doesn't require that much money. It does involve community engagement. But if you've got anybody that cares in your community about keeping your school alive and vibrant, they should be involved in robotics, even if, in FIRST Robotics, even if they're not a technology company. And so, again, this is another example where students could be getting, instead of it's an after-school program that gets in the way of their lessons, this is something that could be incorporated to be part of what they're getting graded on. Every year as governor, I get a chance to receive the Boy Scout Annual Report. Uh, in North Dakota last year, 97 Scouts earned the rank of Eagle Scout, over 19,000 hours of community service. There was 4,077 merit badges awarded across our state to boys and girls because Boy Scouts is now uh, <clears throat> open to all. And, the, and whether that was in public health, personnel management, citizenship, much more, uh, all kinds of competencies. Some of those merit badges offer certificate training programs that are not involved even in our class A schools, much less our class B schools. And so the skills and knowledge you know, here again, here's a certification program with standards that are set that could be part built into a graduation pathway. And, and uh, this, is the, this is the throwaway slide. Uh, the staff came up with this. I don't know where they found it. Uh, it has nothing to do with education. It just shows that I could rock the scarf look back in the 60s. Uh, and then I want people to know we don't have the picture of me wearing the scarf in the 1970s when we weren't still in Cub Scouts. Uh, but... I, you know who you are. Some of you were there. You wore them to the dances, you know, like we did at Herb's Barn. The scarf look, it was cool. Uh, <clears throat> high shoes, 70s. What, everybody was born in 1980? Nobody here? Everybody that was, everybody that was born in the, in the 60s or 50s must be watching online, but you know what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, back to the program. Uh, <clears throat> we're also excited to share North Dakota's taken a visionary step in developing a state-level portrait of a graduate. This framework exemplifies the attributes that North Dakotans believe are critical to the success of each student in our graduates from our K-12 schools so that they're ready for their career, for their college, for their community. They're ready for whether they want to go to the military, whether they want to go into a career in tech, or whether they want to go on to college. This makes sure that they're ready. The portrait of a gratitude, the portrait of a graduate, which we're gr grateful for, Seven elements came out of this work, critical thinking, empathy, learner's mindset, perseverance, adaptability, collaboration, and communication. Uh, there is material that's gonna be made available to all of you. It looks like this, this is not a reading test, uh, but this is the, the flip side, the two-page portrait of a graduate, and this was a foundational element in supporting Senate Bill 2196, which provides schools the flexibility towards personalized learning. Students can have personalized learning, this is what they should have when they graduate. So again, this effort included voices from across the state, individuals in and outside the education sector. It's not a mandate, it serves as a North Star. It can guide you in, in developing young people with the knowledge and skill to be prepared for whatever path they choose after graduation from K-12. So thanks for everybody that worked on that. Technology could be a whole keynote. We've got one slide. We're, we're not talking about technology today, but I just wanna say, 
there is so much technology. So many of you have had your hands on so much technology this last year, you're probably sick of it and ready to go back and just drop all of it. But as we step back and take a look over the next couple years and we realize the tools that are available, there are ways for us to innovate. And technology is not at its best when all it does is take something we did before and automate it. You know, having a university teacher in front of a live classroom of 20 people and now having a university teacher with a camera in the back in front of three students who came in and 17 are watching at home delivering the same lecture they did in person, that isn't really what I would call a technological or productivity or an education advancement. That's using the same thing, but you're just doing the same thing, but you're doing it remotely. That you know, has some value. It had some value during a pandemic. But technology is often really about scale. You know, many of you, I'm sure, you can't, you can't watch a uh, NBA playoff game or anything on TV and pretty soon, you know, up comes an ad for, you know, a master class. A master class. Any of us as adults could now, you know, we used to have things that we'd fund at the state or at universities called adult learning. Well, now there's a new thing called competition. Instead of taking it from the local university that's nearby that you have to go into a class, you can sign up for a master class and learn almost any topic you want at an incredibly low, low price. You do not have to pay Harvard tuition to, to learn from the best teachers in the world about a subject that you're interested in at any point in your life. And guess what? You could still be a high school kid and sign up for a master class. Now, I know that we think that our schools are all little monopolies, they're geographic monopolies, and at K-12, we don't think about competition, we don't think about that at all. <clears throat> and was I like hitting my slides and moving around and crazy? Oh, great, we're back, thank you. Uh, the, but technology is, works when you can scale things. And we do have some incredible teachers in our state, you know who, who some of them are, and those teachers, uh, if they're only teaching you know, 14 people in an AP class at one high school in one of our large markets, and they could be teaching that AP class to 1,000 students across the state, let's figure out how do we make that happen. Let's figure out how do we get classes to the parts of the state, because you know, I know what it was like to be a class B student. I know all the classes that we didn't have that they had in Fargo. So let's use technology at, for scale. Let's use technology for getting stuff to places where it hadn't been. Let's not use technology for, for, for just thinking that we're using technology, we're not actually changing anything. That's my whole, uh, I'm done on technology, but you know, if you wanna hear more, come spend a day with me. Some of the legislators have, they know what I, how I feel. But I am excited about one thing, and that's about uh, snow days. Uh, did any of you have snow days this last year in your schools? Look at that, no hands went up. Maybe we should get a picture of that, because that could be the first time in the history of the state uh, that we've had no snow days. And, and that was also because of technology. I shared this at a governor's conference recently when they were asking about silver linings of COVID. I mean, we, we can flip to virtual now. I mean, when I was a kid growing up in Arthur, uh, the only day we ever got up early was on a snow day. It wasn't the day that you, you were so excited, you know, you'd get up and then you'd watch the little tape go across the bottom of WDAY, and then you'd see Castleton, and then you'd be like, they're getting closer, and then you'd be like, come on, and then there'd be buses running one hour late. You'd be like, ah, I've got to go to school. You've all been there, right? Anyway, but now, you know, like we're done with snow days. You don't have to have five days built into the calendar anymore, uh, so I'm sure that's disappointing for students, but it would have been for me. Uh, choice ready, we've talked about. Framework that integrates growth and gains, specific indicators, is again, post-secondary, workforce, military. The framework was there. We have a chance to build into it even more with the, uh, our visions for, the, for structuring uh, mastery and building new pathways. Uh, we've got great examples of what's going on in CTE. Here's a picture of the, the well-documented success of the Bismarck Public Schools partnership with with Bismarck State College right here. Uh, we also, again, way to go legislators, Senate Bill 2289 creates a new North Dakota scholarship program by combining two current scholarship programs. One was for academics and one was for CTE. And we know that career and technical achievement and academic honors, they can't be separate. So now we've taken the step to recognize that students demonstrating workforce and academic greatness and this new scholarship provides us recognition about what it means to exemplify to be choice ready. And so this is a, you know, another step forward for CTEs, so a way to go. Another huge thing from the legislature, huge, 
$70 million in Career Academy funding uh, from the legislature, never before amount like this. It's a major, major commitment. These are match dollars. Uh, communities will compete for these grants. If you raise $10 million in your community, you get $10 million from the state. Let's give it up for the legislature again. Let's give it up for CTE. It's fantastic. <laughs> and, it, and we need partnerships. You're gonna hear about some of that more today. It's happening in Dickinson, but it needs to happen. Every one of our 11 universities has got to be involved some way, somehow with K-12. If you're anywhere near our university and they're not engaged with what you're doing, uh, whether it's whether it's dual credit, whether it's other kind of programs, reach out, build those relationships, uh, and we can make our education system even stronger. Uh, the other thing we you know, celebrated was the you know, education policy. It's been dubbed the Learn Anywhere Bill. The House Bill 1478 recognizes that learning can happen outside classroom walls. Co-op opportunities, student structured entrepreneurs, apprenticeships, internships, uh, there's a new study that's coming out of Fargo that's going to likely indicate that there's about a threefold return for us uh, as citizens and taxpayers. So every dollar that goes into programs like internships and co-ops, there's about a $3 benefit that comes back up. And again, students can learn anywhere. Uh, another throwback one here. This is a, a in Arthur on... Main Street, this is the Doug and Denny Incorporated. That's Denny Home in the middle. That's me on the left, uh, Brian Wisher on the right. I mean, this was not a super successful startup. I've been involved in some that worked out better. Uh, but the, and, and it, it could have been, I actually, you know, you'd think I would know who the two guys are in the back, but I think we might have hired too many employees right off the bat. We probably grew too fast. And it, you say shoe shine and lemonade. Uh, you can imagine the demand in Arthur in the 1960s for people walking down the street and getting their shoes shined uh, in front of that, in front of the old uh, uh, <clears throat> mercantile building. They sold international stuff. You can imagine the huge demand, not. Uh, but we, we had big dreams. And then on the first day we were open, I had an aunt uh, who was like 120 years old. Uh, at least she seemed to be when I was that young. But anyway, Aunt Marge came down and she brought a giant paper bag of shoes that she dug out of the attic, I didn't know that, that hadn't been polished in 20 years. And we thought we hit a gold mine, because we were, I think you can read there, I think it's shoes or 10 cents uh, we were charging for a shoe shine. And she brought this bag of shoes, must have had 25. We had like two and a half bucks of shoe shine business the first morning. And we were like, we're golden. This is going, this is going places. And, I, that, and we never had another pair after Aunt Marge brought that bag down, but I've always had good support from the family. I thank Aunt Marge for that, supporting young entrepreneurs. The lemonade side of the business went better, but I'm thinking back now that perhaps I could have graduated like from third grade sooner, because I might have gotten credit for this entrepreneurial thing, because you can even learn from your failures. So teachers, be thinking about how you're gonna build this into graduation pathways. Uh, <clears throat> behavioral health is the next important topic. It's one of our key priorities. It continues you know, investing in prevention, in intervening, in intervening when possible, ensuring that we've got treatment and recovery services available. As we talked about at the beginning, the First Lady's been instrumental in breaking the shame and the stigma associated with addiction and mental in illness. You break the shame and the stigma, and then people will actually seek treatment. They'll go to the counselor in the school. We've got to make sure we've got behavioral health resources embedded in every building in the state, and that people that need it will actually feel comfortable using it. That they're not being told by teachers or friends or parents that that's not the thing you should do. We should just, we're North Dakotans, we just got to suck it up, because that, that leads to, that's, that's a dark path if we don't get support to the people that are suffering from this. Recovery Reinvented, Monday, October 25th. Uh, put it on your calendars. It'll be like this, it'll be hybrid and virtual. Even if you're in the classroom, you're teaching, there'll be great things that you can, can tie into. You may want to even incorporate some of the keynotes from Recovery Reinvented into your classroom programming, uh, but, but make sure you take a look at that. At the summit, here, two years ago, uh, the Behavioral Health Division Director, fantastic director, Pam Sagnus, from, from the Human Services in North Dakota, uh, talked and introduced ways to enhance behavioral health efforts in school. Uh, since that time, we continue to advance programs. We got a million and a half in grant funds available per year for schools to the behavioral health 
group, the Prevention and Early Intervention Pilot, was first awarded to Simley Middle School here in Bismarck. It was expanded to two additional schools, Dunseeth Public School and Barnes County North Public School. We're learning from those. They're working, but we need to have funding and we need to keep growing the number of buildings that are actually involved in that prevention and early intervention pilot. Uh, we also have got behavioral health and education, resources and opportunities. This is known as Be Hero. If you're not familiar with it, make sure you become familiar with it and we'll make sure that as part of the follow-up, you get a chance to take a look at these, whether they're family support strategies or educator stress management things. But the uh, upcoming school year behavioral health division will be offering virtual mental health and suicide professional development so you can tie in. So our human services department is gonna be continuing to engage and reach out all of this at no cost to individuals that work within the K-12 system. And this underscores the importance of our state's investment in behavioral health and students. We know that teachers need to be able to teach and not be focused on behavioral health. Uh, we also are working, you know, again, in new strategies relative to criminal justice because we know that students who are at risk, if they're at risk and they end up engaging, you know, it's great that we have the community resource officers, that we have police, if you will, in our school buildings, but if the first time the kid's in trouble, their referral goes to someone the criminal justice system versus they go to a behavioral health council. We are setting kids on the path. It happens in other states. It's the school to jail pipeline. We have to have engagement. It's great having the resource officers there, but we have to be able to take a look at these quote discipline problems and look at what's underneath there. And the Department of Corrections, the juvenile division has been committed to reinventing how we engage with at risk youth and how we engage in a more positive and productive way within our schools. Um, House Bill 1035, the great news from the legislature keeps on coming, created a better pathway to access services without needing to enter the juvenile justice system. We had great services there in juvenile justice, but you shouldn't have to get involved in that system to access those. So again, this is multiple state agencies addressing children and families with wraparound supports. And as we've learned, if you, try, if you punish a disease, okay, if someone has the disease of addiction, and they're, quote, a user, and then you're gonna lock up the user in jail, that's like, that's like taking, again, someone who's got cancer or diabetes, instead of treating the disease, you say, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, put you in jail for a year and see if you get better. People don't get better when they're incarcerated if the reason they're incarcerated is because it's an underlying disease. Punitive approaches are just wrong. We've been doing it for 30 years. Let's have some humility. Let's understand that you know, if the war on drugs is not a war on drugs, it's a war on people who've got if it's about the users, it's a war on the people who are suffering from addiction. Let's stop that war. Let's have, we can have a war about you know, people that are selling drugs. We can have a war on that. We don't need to have a war on the users. Rather, you know, these moments uh, you know, that we need, we need to create moments of interaction between children that are struggling and adults can be uh, critical at that, at that point. During the 219 Summit, I had the privilege of recording a podcast with the acclaimed author and educator, Dr. Stuart Ablon. I'm so thrilled to say that he is back again today. He will be here providing a keynote today uh, virtually. And he emphasized then, and he will again today, that children, they lack the skill, not the will. If children are misbehaving, it's not because they don't have the desire, they don't have the skill. So we'll hear more about how vital it is that students are ready to learn, teachers are ready to teach, and, and you're gonna really enjoy that. Don't miss that one today. Early childhood learning. It's the last, another amazing segment of our amazing legislature this last year, House Bill 1466, one that people said would never pass in North Dakota, which is unfortunate that people feel that way because brain development starts young, reading, being read to, being exposed to vocabulary, you've all seen the studies. It's, it, it's, it, it's all about the exposure that kids have before they get to school that sets them up for success when they do those tests in second grade or fourth grade and we assess our state. It is all about that. And we now have a proposed best-in-class four-year program which builds on, on, on what's driven results, these high-quality supported interactions between adults and children based on developmentally appropriate experiences. And in a high-quality early childhood program, the staff can be trained to recognize developmental delays. Sometimes we don't see it soon enough. Joe, who's our oldest son, great kid, got read to a lot, you know, went to, 
to like a Montessori preschool. We didn't figure out he was dyslexic till he was in second grade. You know, I was a new dad. I was a new dad, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't see that. I just was like, oh, I'll just you know, correct, keep correcting the words. And then he was able to read children's book. Why? Because he, had, he, had, he, could, he could memorize the words. He was memorizing the shape of the words. He couldn't do phonetics. I mean, phonics, he couldn't do that. You know, so you know, what, would he have gotten a better start if we'd identified that when he was four years old instead of when he was six and a half? I think so. But anyway, let's train people so they can see this stuff. We got proven approaches. Virtually, not every other state, but so many states have done this. And, and, and we, we, there's 20 plus years of research I mean, there's states like Alabama that have put in four-year four programs that have just completely transformed the results they're getting in elementary school. So we finally have a shot at doing that here in North Dakota. The best-in-class four-year program, it's being run out of human services, working with child care providers. Any early child care stakeholder who wants to become part of this initiative can compete for funds. The funding is going to allow the state to award an inaugural cohort 20 groups of children around the state. The work in the programs will be monitored, evaluated and, evaluated and supported to ensure that the investment we make has an impact. I think that's important. Probably could have skipped that step because pretty sure that if it's worked in 25 other states, it's probably gonna work here, but we'll prove it out. We'll show to people that it works. And then it should be available to every, every, every child in the state should have access to these kinds of capabilities. Not just a few, not just the 20 groups, but hey, we'll take it, it's a start. Uh, <clears throat> It does not require, H, you know, HB 1466 doesn't require any cur current early childhood program to change or stop what they're doing. It's a grant program. Stakeholders can apply for it if they are interested. And it represents targeted state investments in those 20 programs where people are committed to delivering the highest quality experiences to children and families. And those actions can demonstrate the return on investment that's possible with intentional research supported investments in early childhood. We're behind in this area, but we have a chance now to, to, get, to get going. Uh, this afternoon, one of the breakouts, you're gonna hear from Devil's Lake Public Schools. They didn't wait uh, for this bill to pass. They're not you know, waiting to apply for the program. They committed as a district that they're gonna make sure that every student in their district has an opportunity to be supported if they want to with early learning and quality childcare for staff and for students. Uh, they'll, we're gonna learn from leaders like this on how they're intentionally focusing on this pre-K element and what it could mean to them. So that's another approach the districts could take. You don't need to wait for the, to be part of the 20, just go for it uh, and, and run your own programs. But rather it's, this is about, you know, helping to ensure that, that kids are ready to learn. It's not about teaching a four-year-old any particular topic or idea or fact and testing them. It's making sure that they're meeting developmentally appropriate milestones and make sure that they've got access to experiences that stimulate their natural curiosity. As we head down the home stretch to close out here, I want to go back to a touchstone, which is the, the six powerful words of our, of our purpose statement that we have in our administration. And these you can see right there on the screen, which are empowering people, improving lives, and inspiring success. And I think about those six words, and I think about that's what educators get up and do every day. That's why you got into the business you got into. And, <clears throat> And every North Dakotan, whether you're an ed educator or not, if you're a community member, if you're a parent, a grandparent, if you're whoever you are, if you're a business owner and you might need workforce in 10 years, the, you have to have, you have a stake in what we are doing in education in North Dakota. All of you, we've got to work together to get everybody in the community involved in understanding the importance that education has on the future of our state. We have an opportunity to build world-class educational opportunities inside our schools and outside of our schools. And as you'll hear from Ron Berger again, part of what we're gonna talk about is excellence is a product of culture. And that culture is in the building, it's in the district, but it also needs to be in the community. The communities have to have high expectations as well. And to transform schools with a culture of excellence, it means that you've gotta have that uh, support. One of the things that we know from the work that Jim Collins has done, the research he's done, is that thing that gets in the way of greatness, it's not, it is, it's not when things are bad. What gets in the way of greatness is when things are good. Good is the enemy of great. This is a challenge in North Dakota. 
I talk to people all the time who tell me we have good schools in North Dakota. That's true. I went to a good Class B school when I was a kid. We have good schools. We have good teachers. We don't have the monumental inner city, you know, front page every day, failing high school, you know, with, <clears throat> that is just just a disaster. You can find those in every single major. You can find a failing public school in a gigantic failing public school in almost every major metropolitan area in our nation. We don't have those. So we've got good, we've got good schools. But the good schools then leads to complacency. It leads us to say it's good, it's good enough. When I toured school with Phoebe, a junior in high school, and then I ran him to spend a day with a student thing a couple years ago, Everything I saw was good, but it was starkly familiar with what, it, what I had gone through 40 years ago. Classroom buzzer, classroom buzzer. I mean, yeah, there was a whiteboard instead of a chalkboard, and they had, some people had laptops instead of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, in, instead of an overhead projector, but some of it was the same. And we can, we can, if we're going to be great, we've got to think about new approaches. And so we, we know that education is not just about school. It's about family. It's about community. It's about all those things. We have in our small state the opportunity to have a holistic approach. But the thing that's going to drive us from good to great is going to be two things. One is we have to believe that competition is okay. It's okay that we have competition. It's okay that a student can choose you know, what class they take or what district they go to, that's okay. People voting with their feet is a good thing. It's a signal from the market that tells us whether we're doing a good job or not. We also have to have the curiosity to learn from others and other schools and other states. We have to have that mindset that allows us to continually improve. And I want to say a personal story about how curiosity and why it's important to me and why, why, why am I up here passionately talking for this amount of time about education? It's not just because it's 51% of the budget. It's partly because education mattered to me growing up. My mother was an educator. You know, she built into all of us the importance of learning and lifelong learning. I'm blessed with that. She was both a teacher and an administrator. And also then I, when I was when I was an entrepreneur and I was a young kid and I was in my 20s and I was trying to do a, a startup here in North Dakota and people were saying, you know, telling me over and over and over, you cannot build a world-class software company in North Dakota. You need to move. You got to follow everybody else. You got to go to Silicon Valley. And what did we do? We hired kids from your schools. We hired kids from 220 different towns in North Dakota. We built a world-class company out of class B kids. We took kids that came from that education, but when they got there, you know what they had to do? They didn't know everything they needed to know when they got there. They got into an organization where they had to become continuous learners because the only way we were gonna win and win around the globe was we had to get better and smarter. We had to learn new technologies and new approaches constantly or we'd be out of business. So continuous learning is not like a new thing for me. This is like a, how do people not do continuous learning? You can't be successful in the 21st century unless you are a continuous learner. And the key to continuous learning is keeping curiosity alive. So what did I do? Because I got, I started having kids late. I'd been an entrepreneur for 15 years, battling my brains out in this industry when my kids came along. When I dropped them off at school in the morning, did I tell them, behave, that I do, you know, what parents do all over the nation, hey, behave and get good grades. I never said that to my kids, get good grades. You know what I said to my kids every morning? A ask any of them. Corner them in a hallway, they're not listening to this talk. Ask them, what did your dad say when he dropped you off at school? I said, ask good questions, thank you. I said, ask good questions. And then when they would dinner at night, I would say to them, I didn't say, did you behave? Teachers probably wished I would have said that. Uh, but I, I, when at dinner, I'd say, tell me the best question you asked today. At dinner, we would talk about the quality of the questions that they asked during the day. And one of my kids, the youngest one's an introvert. That wasn't easy for him. My daughter, she was, ha she's, you know, front row, happy, hand up. Uh, but, you know, kids are different. But the key is learning is curiosity. And you strengthen your curiosity skills by learning and practicing to ask good questions. When I went to parent-teacher conferences for over 20 years, as all of them went through that system, 
every parent-teacher conference I went to, if it was a new teacher, the first thing they said to me was, wow, your kids, your kid or kids asked really good questions. That's the first thing they said. They said, that's all I need to know. We're done with the conference. Thank you. Uh, and <clears throat> sometimes they said, well, we wish they'd show up more and we wish they'd behave better, but they do ask really good questions. Uh, so anyway, this is the key, is curiosity. And then what's the reward of that? This is a more recent picture. I mean, the reward is that Catherine and I get to hang around with people that when I am with them, every time I'm with them, I don't give them action items like a parent. I leave with action items. They ask me dozens of questions. Why did you decide this? Who did that? What are, why aren't we doing this? Did you read about this? Have you heard this podcast? The amount of continuous learning that's available to young people today outside the classroom, unbelievable. They have an interest, they can learn about it, and then they challenge me. And so there's this this thing that we started when they were really little is just still reaping rewards. And I'm, I'm a better governor because of the questions they ask me. So courage. <clears throat> One of my favorite books that I, that I read back in the 1980s was by a classic by Jean-Louis Servant Schreiber. Uh, no relation to Cindy, I don't think, because he's French. Uh, but anyway, in his classic book, uh, The Return of Courage, he says, every human is a formidable fear factory, a formidable fear factory. So consciously or unconsciously, most of us are driven by our fears versus being pulled by our dreams. And in a world of social media, when you can get attacked by the fringes from every side, both ends, however you describe it, fear becomes a real thing. It becomes a real thing for elected leaders, for school board members, for, for, for administrators, for teachers. Yeah, I want to try this new thing, but I'm not sure. This one parent was upset. They're going to post about it. You know, I'm going to get censured. I mean, it's like fear drives behaviors. But a life, life is short. I know this because my, my, I had a dad that passed away at 54, a brother that passed away at age 58. Life is short. But a life that's well lived is one that can free itself of those fears, free itself of the fears and have the courage to take action. The author goes on to say in this book, The Return of Courage, that the gateway between dream and reality is that of courage. So I'm asking all of you today to, when you have the toolkit of things that you need to drive transformational change, courage is one of the things you actually need. You can have all the assessments, all the tools, all the data. Courage takes many forms. And you, each of you, each of you listening today, leading by example to elevate the student voice, leading the way our legislators have to bring the other rest of the 141 body forward into the progressive thinking that's occurring here and the funding that's occurring here. Reimagine how education is designed, how it can be a game-changing impact on our students, our state, and our country, but that will take courage. So my third challenge in closing today is to all of you that are listening now or in the future or virtually or here is to challenge you to not just leave with ideas, not just leave with intentions, not just leave with plans, but to leave with a commitment, with the courage that you're gonna take the opportunity that's been handed to you, the enormous funding plus the incredible framework for transformation that you're gonna leave and you're gonna have the courage to move forward and take action. You're gonna to return to your communities. You're gonna begin the critical conversations. You're gonna create a vision that your community will celebrate and stand behind. You will be a voice for change and you'll rally behind the transformative opportunity that's been happened to you. People have always said, we don't like top down. There's not top down. This is a framework. This is the beauty of bottom up. I mean, this is an amazing thing we've created for education in K-12. Funding plus policy framework, plus the support, plus the encouragement, plus behavioral health, plus CTE. Wow. Wow. I mean, I don't know how it gets any better. I, I know the other governors don't know how it gets any better because they're like, those guys in North Dakota are getting it done. But this work is not easy. It's not about taking great new legislative policy and going back and having your school board say, we're gonna adopt it. True transformation takes commitment at all levels. You've gotta dig in, you've gotta to work to the change process, you've gotta define the outcomes. It's not about you know, just creating a program, but as I've said many, many times, it's, it's a culture of excellence that's built on the core values of gratitude and humility and curiosity and that oh so needed element, that element of courage. Any one of you can be a pioneer in education, but you need to make the choice. 
You've got to make the choice to have the courage that you're not just here to get some credits today. You're not just here to check a box. You're not here because somebody asked you to go. You're here because you want to have the courage to become a champion who, who will witness the success and the growth and the achievement of the students whose lives you're gonna change. TR once said, far and away, the best prize that life has to offer is the chance to work hard at work worth doing. That prize is within each of your grasp. You have been handed the opportunity. That prize is your choice. And I wanna propose to each of you, I wanna gift to each of you the courage to grab that price multiply the positive impact you're already having, multiply it tenfold with these transformational changes and impact the future of those that we're here to serve. And that's the 120,000 students in our state. Thank you very much and have a fantastic conference.